Hello. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Professor Catherine Lyon, um, and I am your sociology instructor. So welcome. We have finished one full week of the course. Um, and what I would like everyone to do is to think of the most important thing they remember from this first week. So on Canvas, we had a live lecture and then you had mini lectures in the module and uh, a short reading. Um, and you commented on the lecture and you did a discussion. I really have liked watching your discussions of um, looking at fertility around the world. It was great to see you being really thoughtful and creative in tying in national context and you picked so many different countries. So good job, keep that up. Um, so I would like everyone in the chat box to write down one word or one sentence uh, that you think was the most important academic point from this week's content. So it could be a concept or a theory um, or something that you would focus on the most if you were studying for this module. So take a minute to write it down in the chat. Okay, so lots of people are saying the sociological imagination, which is the concept from Mills from his book, The Sociological Imagination in 1959. And then Husen, sorry if I said your name wrong, um, has said public issues. So how are public issues related to the sociological imagination? Can anyone explain in the chat the relationship between the sociological imagination and public issues? Why would those go together? So Z-Way has said the ability to see the relationship between individuals and society. So that's the definition of the sociological imagination. But underneath this imagination, you have smaller concepts. So one concept is public issues and the other concept is private troubles. Um, so, or personal troubles. Yes, thank you, Zhu Wan. Sorry if I said your name wrong. It'll take me a while to learn your names. Um, but I look forward to getting to know each of you this term because we get to be together until April, which is fantastic. Um, so let's think about a private trouble versus a public issue. A private trouble is something that is unique just to me as one person. It's something that is caused by myself and that I can fix myself. Um, but a public issue is something that is rooted in the society. It's something to do with institutions like the economy or politics or healthcare. Um, and it's something that affects large numbers of people. And individual people, if they face a problem like unemployment and it's a public issue, they can't fix the unemployment all by themselves because it's something happening in the larger society, like with COVID right now. Okay, so I see a lot of sociological imagination, public issues, private troubles. Um, then I saw something else. Yi Wei said generation location. So thank you. That's excellent. Um, so I would say that's another key concept for this module. Generation location comes from um, a sociologist. Does anyone know the name of the sociologist that came up with generation location? This is another thing you would want to put in your notes. So you'd want to put the name of the concept and then the person. Carl Mannheim, awesome, thank you. Um, so Carl Mannheim came up with this idea of generation location, which is the argument that when we are born and where we are born gives us access to particular ways of knowing and understanding the world. So if you're born, and as you're a young person, there's a world war, then a lot of people the same age in the same country that go through that war will have similar experiences and for the rest of their life will have a specific way of thinking from that time period. So people who live through a Great Depression 
often have different money and spending habits than people who don't live through a Great Depression. So this is generation location. So that is our quick review of module one. Um, and now we are going to start this live lecture um, with your module one quiz. So every week you do a small quiz that has 10 questions on it. And this comes to a total of 15% of your course grade. So each quiz is about worth 1% of your final grade. Uh, so it has 10 questions. They're multiple choice and true false questions. And the quiz is going to open up in Canvas soon under module two. Um, first, I would like to know if anyone has any questions before we start the quiz. You're going to have 15 minutes to do it together. So this is an individual quiz. OK, then I'm going to show you how it works. Uh, so if you go into our Canvas course, Soci 101, and scroll down to Module 2, Thinking Like a Sociologist, the very first thing there is the Module 1 quiz. So it says, you will complete this during the live lecture, September 21st at 1 PM. And this quiz covers the module one lectures, the readings and the syllabus. So everything you just did the past week is now on this quiz. Plus today it has the course syllabus to make sure you understand the course um, assignments and instructions. So if you click on this, you should be able to start the quiz. So please start the quiz now. You have 15 minutes. This is an individual quiz, so only uh, work on your own. Um, and I'll be here if you have any questions. Good luck. I will see you in 15 minutes. Okay, hello, welcome back. Um, thank you for completing the quiz. So that's an example of the quiz that we will have each week. And the quizzes are worth just a very small percentage. They're less than 1% each. Um, and I think they're a good way for you to stay on top of your studying um, and to have a chance to see how you are doing. Because we have a midterm and a final exam, the quizzes give you a sense of if you're understanding the material and they're very low risk. So if you have a bad quiz, it's less than 1% of your grade. Um, and then that's a chance to come to office hours to talk about it. Okay, so some people are putting sad emojis in the chat box here. So uh, today's quiz is uh, just a good chance for you to see the expectations of this course. Uh, does anyone have questions about the quiz content? Is there anything you'd like to clarify before we go on? So does anyone have questions about the, uh, the material from module one before we start module two now? Okay, if you have specific um, technical questions about the quiz, then uh, please come to office hours after today's lecture so that uh, we can talk about it with you. But right now I just wanna talk about the specific content of the quiz, if there's any questions about module one. Bruce is asking when the live lecture is. So our class time is scheduled from one to three o'clock. So what we're doing is having a live lecture from one to 2.30, and then you have the rest of the time to do the module for the week. And then I'll have office hours as soon as our live lecture ends. So if we finish live lecture today at 2.30, then I'll stay on here for office hours. Everything is going to be fine. OK, so let's get started um, with the lecture for today. So the question I asked you to think about to explore the sociological imagination is, why are you attending university? How did you end up here? Did you think about attending university when you were a small child? Was this something you always thought you were going to do? And how did you end up picking um, Canada and UBC? 
So you don't have to share your answer to this. Just think about it for a moment. Why are you attending university? And now what we're going to do is we're going to think about this question sociologically in terms of the sociological imagination. So we're going to shift our focus from you as the unit of analysis, your life goals, you as the focus of inquiry, and consider the social context in which you are acting. How is this moment with you at UBC put together by society <clears throat> through various social layers? And we're gonna use the sociological imagination, a way of seeing to analyze your education sociologically. Before we do that, I have a question for you. What do you think this is a picture of? You can write your guesses in the chat. Uh, seaweed, a cell, <laughs> fire, a volcano, a starfish, an octopus, a monster, just artwork, pizza. Uh, it's Beth says it's just weird. Hair, is it a dress? Is it meat? Art. <laughs> Okay, these are all good guesses. Uh, so I'm going to show you what it is now. You are all incorrect. It is a rooster. Um, and so now I'm going to flip through a series of images where we're going to zoom further and further out. And with every image, <laughs> I want you to think about how does your understanding of what you're looking at change with each image. I also want to make sure that everyone has their microphone off so that the sound quality is high. So can you just check and make sure your microphone is off, please? Um, so are you ready to see the images? Here we go. It's not creepy. It's cool. <laughs> Another dimension. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of like a Russian doll. Where will it end? And that is the end. So I would like you on this Oops, I would like you to write on this blank page here um, a word that this image makes you think of. So you can use the text function and write right here. What does this make you think of? I'll give you one minute to write down something. So above the PowerPoint, there should be uh, tools that you can use. Vague.
we are tiny reality, that we're just a small part of the world. Society, what else? How tiny we are. Okay, so there's 10 comments up here and there's 86 people in this class. I wanna see some more comments. Unlimited, the world is endless. What you see may not be true. Is it a puzzle? Science and technology. Maybe we're controlled by others. Everything is bigger than we think. Optical illusion. So these images are from a children's book that's called Zoom. It's written in 1995, and it's by Istvan Banye, a Hungarian-American artist. And there's no words at all in the book, but the images say a lot. You don't even need words. And I think it's a book that has a lot of imagination. I often wonder what the author is trying to tell us. And for me, it's thinking about it's inviting us to think differently about our circumstances. Uh, different perspectives bring very new meaning to the situation. What I thought was just a rooster was actually just a child's game. Because when I stepped back, I could see it was coordinated differently. So it's inviting us to think about connections happening between the local, the national, and the global. And when we make these connections in a systematic way, using research evidence and thinking about the layers of social life, this becomes the sociological imagination. Sociology, more than anything else, is a way of seeing the world. It's a way of connecting personal situations to what is happening in your neighborhood, in your city, in your country, and around the world. And often these connections are invisible unless you search for them and document them and analyze them. This is what module one was about. And today we are going to summarize module one by thinking about your own education, your decision to go to university. So when something good or bad happens in our lives, when we start a new school, when we get a job, when we change a relationship, we often give ourselves full credit. If it's good, we congratulate ourselves. And if it's bad, we blame ourselves. Mills draws a connection between our private experiences and broader public trends. Mills argued we have unique biographies, personalities, friendships, and also our own habits, perspectives, and resources. At the private level, these unique circumstances shape our lives, but there is more to consider. We are also affected by broader institutional changes, the economy, politics, media, the legal system. So our key question for today's lecture is, what are the public roots of your decision to attend university. This seems like a private decision, but Mills and sociologists would argue this is actually a public issue, that most private decisions have public roots. So with our key concepts of private troubles and public issues, let's now turn back to our question about education. Why are you in university? Who actually goes to university? How is university attendance shaped by generation location, by the historical time period you are living in? How is university attendance a socially structured 
practice. And I have four questions to ask our class. And I'm going to use the poll function to do this. So think about this question, who goes to university and who doesn't go to university? And then I'm going to share a poll with you. I'm just gonna set it up right now. And I'm going to ask um, our TAs to keep track of the answers to the poll. Okay, so here we have poll one starting. The question is, did you have a male parent or guardian attend university? Has everyone answered? Okay, so now I'm going to write these down. And I'm going to ask you another question. The next poll is going to ask you, can you see the responses? So this is what our class answered. Okay, great. So think about what we're seeing here. The majority of the class has had a male parent or guardian attend university. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you the same thing about a female parent or guardian. There's the poll for that. So it looks like we have um, 48 people saying yes, 23 people saying no, and 17 people not responding. So if you're in this class, uh, please make sure that you are answering this poll. Okay, so I'm gonna write down the answers now. 48 for yes, 23 for no and no one said they weren't sure. Now I'm gonna ask you a different question. We're gonna think now about your uh, grandparents' generation. Did you have a male grandparent attend university? So think about whether you know the answer to that. And here's your poll. Okay, so Jessica is saying, I don't even think they could attend university. So that's a really good uh, thing to think about. So is this a personal decision or is it a publicly structured issue? So we're going to talk about that. Keep thinking like that. Okay, so we have 12 non-responses. We have 21 yeses. We have 52 no's. 
and four people aren't sure. So guess what my final poll question is going to be? It is going to be about female grandparents attending university. So think about your female grandparents. And here is your very last poll. Okay, you have five seconds to answer this question and I'm gonna stop the poll. Five, four, three, two, one. Here are what your responses look like. We have uh, 15 yeses, 61 noes, and five not sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this and now I'm gonna try to show you these results all together so you can see what this looks like. Share screen. Here it is. Okay. So here are the results all together. I want to make sure it's big enough so you can see. So here we can see for your generation, what are the big trends that are coming forward? If you were an analyst and you had to make conclusions about what affects university attendance, what would you say based on these findings here? You can write your answers in the chat. So Jessica might wanna talk about why uh, her parents or grandparents couldn't attend university. And Kevin said that was a fact. So if you have a thought about this, why there's differences between generations or genders, you can actually, um, okay, so single is saying circumstance, so that's good, but we need to identify which circumstances. So I'd really like to hear from you either in the chat or you can raise your hand and unmute your microphone when I call on you, if you have any hypotheses about what's happening here. Jessica's saying the general economy in the nation is low during that time. Okay, so the country that your parents or grandparents were in, there was an economic downturn and people had to go to work instead of pursuing further education. So it's really expensive to go to university, not only the cost of tuition, but because you're taking time not in the labor force when you could be working to support your family. Um, economic levels and war, thank you. So uh, war would absolutely disrupt a whole generation. And as we talked about with generation location, some generations were born into war times and some generations have never experienced war during their life. Um, Kevin saying university was not popular, right? So it's very common today to expect a, a person to go to university, but this wasn't the case before. For our grandparents, many of them, if they were men, could get a good job with just high school education or less. And this is tied a bit to the economy. So Canada today is very much a service economy and a knowledge economy. But if we were living in Canada in 1900, it would be a resource economy where if you were strong, and you could use your body, you could cut down trees or you could mine and you would get a really excellent wage as a man that would support a family. So as the types of sectors of the economy shift, that affects the education level we need and it also changes gender dynamics because women were not seen to be working in the resource economy. Um, I Ting is saying before people's living standard is not that high, so they needed to work, right? Um, the stereotype of women during Jessica's grandparents' age. So let's think about gender here. We are seeing that the least likely group to go to university is female grandparents. 
The next least likely group is male grandparents. So in both generations, your parents and your grandparents, women are less likely to go to university. But we know that in some countries, women are actually more likely to go to university today. So there have been major shifts through feminism, through beliefs about equality um, that have made women more centered in education. But education is still not equal. So overall, there's more women in university, but they're more in the arts faculty and they're less in the science faculty. So we still have work to do there. Um, John Chow is saying masculinism world. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that the public sector and education was seen to be a masculine sphere. Siding is saying how to live is more important than reading. Right, so education teaches you these abstract bits of information um, and it might not be relevant to surviving everyday life. University is an investment, which is a luxury for them back then. Less education sources for college at the time. Right, so university is much more common now. Female grandparents have to, have to look after children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we saw domestic work as women's work. The belief that women don't need to study at all. Okay, great. The Great Cultural Revolution. Um, different expectations from society. The government policy during that time was more likely encouraging productivity, not education. So would anyone like to raise their hand and add a comment? Maybe something that's missing here. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my PowerPoint with you. And I wanna show you something else, which is, when I asked this exact same question to my sociology class a few years ago, these were their results. So this is my Soci 101 class from uh, a few years ago. And the pattern is almost identical to yours. So in the grandparents cohort overall, there was much less post-secondary attendance and women were the least likely in that cohort. Their parents' cohort had a more equal division between men and women, with women actually becoming more dominant. And then their cohort, it was everyone 100% because they are the people that I polled. There's actually something wrong with this data, though. So there's an overrepresentation here of people whose parents went to university. And that is because if you have parents who went to university, you are more likely to go to university. Does anyone, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So think about why that might be the case. So let's look at some broader trends that affect university attendance. So here we can see um, rates of access to university in Canada. So this is a poll done in Canada. And first we look at family income. So if your family income is below $50,000 a year, you have a 29.8% likelihood of going to university. But if your family income is above $50,000, you have a 45% chance of attending university. So there's a big difference there based on class or socioeconomic status. And here's what I was mentioning. If your parents have no post-secondary education, you only have a 24% of going to university. If your parents have gone to university, you have a 47% chance of going. So let's talk about this, parents' education. Why could your parents' education affect your likelihood of going to university? You can answer with your hand up if you want to speak, or you can write in the chat. Okay, so parents' education would influence children's quality of education. How would that happen? 
So parents have an expectation that their children must go to university. So you might be taught that from a very young age. Um, so the value of university. So believing in university is actually a, a cultural value. There's nothing universal or normal about it. So if your family believes in university, then you will probably believe in university. Any other reasons? The way they're teaching might be based on their education level. So think about how your parents uh, spoke to you when you were growing up. Wealthier families tend to have a lot of books around, they have a lot of tools, um, and they're teaching you complex vocabulary that would also be used by your educators. So they're teaching you these invisible symbols that are valued by the education system. They can also afford to pay for you to have tutors and to go to private schools that will help prepare you. Without money, you wouldn't be able to go to university. So there's a variety of factors here. We're seeing financial factors, we're seeing cultural factors about the value in education, and we are seeing something called cultural capital, which I'm gonna write in the chat. Cultural capital is a form of capital um, that gives you a symbolic status. It's a, it's a currency that's exchanged like money, but it's exchanged through symbols. So your parents can pass on high cultural capital to you if they are able to talk about fancy art and history and things that people will recognize as high status. Let's look at some more markers here. Okay, so here we can see where you live, what, ethnic, what ethnicity you're part of, and your health status. So if you live in a city um, you are more likely to go to university than if you live in a more remote part of the country. So if you live in a rural small town, you just have a 33% chance of going. But if you live in a city, you have a 42% chance of going. In Canada, if you are Indigenous or First Nation, you have a 26% chance of going to university. But if you are non-Indigenous, then you have a 40% chance of going. So we can see there the history of residential schools, colonialism, intergenerational trauma. And who created universities? It was the colonial government teaching the colonial information. Indigenous people had their own ways of educating younger generations, and it wasn't through formal schooling. So we can say that education is a colonial tool and we're trying to decolonize it. And then disability and no disability. University assumes a particular type of body and a particular type of mind. If you have a disability, you are 26% likely to go to university, but if you don't, you have a 42% chance of going. But we'll talk later this term about what disability is because most impairments don't have to be disabilities. They become disabilities if they are not accommodated. And there's always ways universities can be more accommodating to differences. Are there any questions or comments about this table? So the next thing I want to look at is university completion by country. So the main point here is that just by being born in one country or another country, you have a higher likelihood or a lower likelihood of going to university. So if you're born in Norway, we can see that 35% of the population has a university degree. But if you live in Austria, that's closer to 10%. If you live in Japan, that is 25%, and Canada is about 26 or 27%. So when we think about the sociological imagination, 
we want to think about, yeah, there's free tuition in Norway. So that's huge. And that is a structural institutional factor. So we want to think about ourselves and our private lives, the people around us, the places that we live, and even the countries that we're living in and how those countries are situated in the global economy. So Mills writes that individual people are shaped by society. If you were born at a different time, or if you were born in a different place, you might not be here today in this lecture. So we know we are shaped by society. But Mills says that individual people also shape society. So what does he mean by this? He's saying it's a two-way process where we're affected by what's around us, but by, by how, how we act every day, we also affect the things around us. We recreate society every day. So right now, by all of us showing up to this lecture, we are reproducing UBC. We could all choose not to, although we're sort of coerced into being here by our responsibilities. So how are we as individual people shaping the education system? Who has an example or an idea? No ideas? So you think that what you do doesn't matter? Okay, we could have a revolution. We could overthrow the system. We could protest. That would be one way to make a small change. We can contribute for the next generation. So the things that you learn at university will affect your children if you have children, for example. Uh, you can contribute to make the course more rich with content. So in your discussions, you're creating the course itself. Uh, feminism, voting, yeah, that's right. So you can vote for the UBC student government system. Um, you can write your papers about justice and equality and feminism topics. Change ourselves first. Right, so let's look at the example of decolonizing university. So we know historically, universities and education systems have been colonial tools, literally through residential school systems. Have you heard about residential school systems? Yes, okay, great. Um, and so what's happening now is universities are trying to decolonize. So some classes are teaching indigenous content and universities now have classes on First Nations languages. We can also take steps to educate ourselves about indigenous worldviews and to make sure we have an open and respectful mind. And that can reshape what university classes look like. And this came from years and years and years of demands and lobbying and protest from indigenous groups and their supporters. So that's a real change that we're seeing now. You also, as international students, have a lot of power to shape the societies that you're studying in. So some of you might have chosen another country. Why did you choose Canada for university? Was anyone thinking of going to a country like the United States? We've seen this major trend where, okay, safety. Mm -hmm. And you might mean safety in terms of health and COVID policies. So we know that Canada has lower COVID rates than the United States. You might have chosen cultural factors like Bainey is seeing more friendly, less discrimination. So maybe you're thinking about multicultural policy in Canada. Shuan is saying their parents ordered them. Um, some people are talking about uh, the political situation and how the government of the United States is very different than the government of Canada. Um, and so because of these factors, we have seen a decline in the number of international students going to the US and an increase in the number of international students coming to Canada. 
And so you each made that choice, or maybe your parents made it for you. Some people look like they had some parents' pressure. Um, but now you are impacting UBC. You can help UBC grow larger, and you're impacting Canadian society. So just that one decision will have effects you don't even realize. So society influences us, and we influence society. And your experiences at UBC will also affect the people that you meet and your family members. And if you have children, that'll shape the minds of your children as well. So, so what? Why is the sociological imagination important? Here's a summary. The sociological imagination seeks to reform and reimagine the way we look at individual agency within our world. So that means individual freedom and power to control our circumstances. And it makes sense of our individual, communal, societal, and global hardships in an effort to solve them together. So the sociological imagination asks, what is the root cause of the challenges you face? Which factors are within your control and which factors are beyond your control? How can each factor best be addressed? So if something is in your control, that means you can change it. And if something is beyond your control, that means that you can't change it. So you need to think of another way of modifying your behavior or of working with other people to make a larger social change. Either way, you're going to use your energy in the best way to address the problem that you face. So there's at least four ways that the sociological imagination is useful. The first is the sociological perspective helps us critically assess common sense ideas and address root causes. So there's lots of beliefs about the root cause of problems. If you think about the problem of poverty, a lot of people using common sense would just blame the poor for being poor. But the sociological imagination asks us, well, why are there different rates of poverty in different countries? Then we can see it's related to the economic systems in those countries. Number two, the sociological perspective helps us to see the opportunities and constraints in our lives. So when we face a challenge, it helps us figure out what is causing that challenge so we can best address it without wasting our time and our energy on the wrong cause. Number three, the sociological perspective empowers us to be active participants in society. So Mill says we are affected by society, but we also affect society. What we do matters. So if you think about COVID-19, each of us has a responsibility to be safe. If we, if we wear a mask, we are protecting other people. We have the power to make this decision. If we don't wear a mask, we can harm hundreds or thousands of people. So the sociological imagination helps us believe in the power of our actions. And four, the sociological perspective helps us live in a diverse world. So if you can think about yourself sociologically and the challenges you face, you can also imagine what it's like to be another person. If there's someone that you don't understand, someone who lives differently than you or looks different than you, imagine what society has done to shape them. What questions do they face? What is their life like? And it helps you have empathy and connection with other people. We're all affected by many of the same common problems, even if it looks different. So this is our lecture for today on the sociological imagination. So this is the key point for module one. You've got sociological imagination and then the smaller concepts inside the imagination of private troubles and public issues. Then you have Mannheim's concept of generation location. After this lecture, you are going to start module two for this week. And module two introduces you to four ways of thinking sociologically. 
So the sociological imagination is one of those ways, but there's three other habits of sociological thinkers. There are, uh, there's one called seeing the strange in the familiar, seeing the general in the particular, and seeing through marginality and crisis. So try to find out the main ideas behind each of those ways of seeing. That is your challenge for this week. And then next Monday, we'll get back together in this live lecture and you'll have a quiz on module two at one o'clock. And then we'll have a new lecture on getting you ready for module three. So thank you so much uh, for coming today. I'm going to stay here if you have any questions. So this will be my office hour starting now. Um, this lecture is also being recorded, so you can watch it again later if you like. Are there any questions before we finish and before my office hours start? Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much. If you would like to stay and talk and ask questions, um, then you're welcome to do so. Oh, Kevin's asking, do we still have your tutorial? Yes, so tutorials start today. So make sure you check your schedule um, so that you can see if your tutorial is this afternoon or if it's tomorrow. The tutorials are mandatory and they're 10% of your final grade. Um, Zihua, what do you mean late? Late for what? Um, starting next week, uh, starting next week, you will be counted as uh, late, but today was okay because it's just a practice. Uh, the tutorial is in Collaborate Ultra, that's right. Uh, Luz is uh, raising your hand, so you can uh, unmute your microphone and uh, speak. Um, so hi, so I have a question about the cultural capital. I didn't like understand the concept. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so cultural capital is this idea from French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. So I'm writing that in the chat. <clears throat> and cultural capital is <clears throat> a symbolic currency that gives power and status to wealthier members of society. So cultural capital is something that you get through the education system and through being born into a wealthier family. And it is the type of knowledge that you have. So do you have knowledge of things that are difficult for most people to access or to understand. So do you understand really fancy art or do you go on really expensive um, trips around the world? If you mention this in a job interview, then it'll give you more power and status. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu argues that it's not just money, that separates the classes, that it's this form of symbolic cultural capital that allows people to symbolically communicate their status, even if you don't know how much money they have. So okay. Zihu is asking, um, is my education cultural capital? So <clears throat> yes, your, your diploma from UBC is a form of cultural capital, but even more than that, it is the way of speaking in academia that is a form of cultural capital and your ability to talk about famous scholars and famous books is cultural capital. Um, so this module, module two, 
you need to leave comments on one video. It doesn't have to be this video. Oh, is playing golf a form of cultural capital? So I think it depends on where you are in the world. So in some countries, it would be difficult to have a lot of golf courses because they take up a lot of space and they need to be watered. So in countries where golf is very expensive to play, then it would be cultural capital. But in countries that have a lot of golf courses and anyone can play, then it's less cultural capital. Uh, do you need to leave comments for others on the video? So you just pick one video each week and leave a comment on that. 